I'm going to give a quick, quick intro to Sam, and then I'll let you introduce yourself, Sam, and then we'll dive in on all of the topics, especially the athletic nerd, which Sam has coined, which is awesome. So <laughs> for context, Sam is a runs sales team at Airtable, and he has a lots of incredible experience leading sales orgs at various PLG companies like Pendo, Algolia, and Mixpanel. Um, and where Sam and I first, I think we met a bit ago, but when we first really started learning about kind of what you did at Airtable was at a dinner where he was talking about this concept of an athletic nerd, which is who you should hire in a product-led sales organization. So then we obviously completely locked on to that as a focus marketing team and did a lot of different marketing endeavors with Sam, as well as some other folks that you'll see coming out soon. Yeah, we borrowed it from Sam. Sam's the real innovator. So we had to get him on an AMA to tell us everything about product-led sales and athletic nerds. So before we dive in, thank you so much for being here, Sam. You want to give yourself a quick introduction beyond what I just covered of the most important of being an athletic nerd? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I like to think I'm an athletic nerd, <laughs> but like you can remove the actual athleticism. The uh, yeah, so happy to be. I love being here. Uh, Sam Warboff. I run uh, what we call the large account segment at Airtable. So um, uh, it's kind of like the mid market, lower enterprise segment at uh, at Airtable. Been at Airtable for almost four years. Born and raised in San Francisco. San Francisco native. Um, uh, went to school at Washington University in St. Louis and then came back and just got right into kind of like the SaaS sales world. And I've been, um, as Alexa said, I've been at a bunch of different kind of pre-IPO, high growth, really PLG companies, even before kind of like this PLG movement was uh, was coined um, and created and, and, uh, and built upon. I look back at like companies like Mixpanel, which I was very proud to be a part of. And, and that motion was very much a, a product led uh, motion in its heyday as well. So it's a really interesting time, I think, because um, sales as a whole and the go to market strategy as a whole has changed a lot from kind of an old school pound the pavement, like hardcore outbound motion to leveraging product in the go to market. Um, but at the same time, there's still very much a need for, and I think what we're going to talk a little bit about today is like very much a need for like a tops down enterprise human led motion. So where those unite, uh, is a really complicated thing that I don't think anyone has a perfect answer to. Uh, but I have made it kind of my passion to try to figure out as much of that problem as I can. So, um, I don't have all the answers, but I'm happy to be here and excited to talk about it. Thank you, Sam. Why don't we start with, I think Airtable is one of the more interesting companies to kind of observe what you all have been doing over the past several years, because Airtable started as really a pure play PLG company. Yeah. And over the last year or so, started focusing way more on the enterprise product and the enterprise sales motion. So I'd be curious to learn a little bit more about what product-led sales looks like at Airtable and kind of what that evolution looked like. Yeah, it's actually been pretty amazing because I joined when I joined Airtable about four years ago, I had come from like a very traditional kind of SaaS uh, sales selling motion. Um, when I joined Airtable, we were really in our infancy. I mean, we had just purchased Salesforce. Uh, we had like a 15-person sales team and no quotas. You know, it was like a very much a... A, a self-serve driven motion, a vast majority of a really strong revenue base was coming from a, a self-serve motion. We were getting thousands of inbound signups a day. Um, and so there was a lot of questions around like, what do we do with, with this stuff? Do we just like, kind of like let that be a self-service motion and make sure that the humans don't cannibalize that business? Or do we go up market and try to sell there, um, et cetera. So when I first came to Airtable, my first job was to try to solve a lot of this kind of like this union between uh, the PLG motion and the, or not the, yeah, kind of the self-serve motion uh, and the and the sales motion. Um, I, I started this team that we call this onboarding specialist team, which like didn't even, was not a sales motion. It was literally, let's put humans in front of, of people who were uh, signing up for the product and see what that does. So like we were focused on, metrics that had nothing to do with revenue, activation metrics, things like uh, a, a metric that we called four week, a multi-active user basis. So like, how do we get an initial sign up to invite three other people? Because we had done a lot of math behind, we had run a lot of data behind. 
what is like, what is that threshold where someone becomes sticky, you know? Um, and so I ran this team called this onboarding specialist team. And I also on, I also ran a, um, uh, what we call like the experiments team, which is basically some data scientists. And like, we ran all of these experiments about like, how do we put humans on top of this really, really strong self-serve engine? And like, what happens? Um, even without a, like a, a quota or revenue generating organization, like just that human touch focused on onboarding, we saw things like conversion rate to pay go up 4X. We saw retention rates go up tremendously. We saw the average land size go up 10X, right? So like, I think that there is a, uh, there is, a, you know, I think you, you run into this thing in the early days where you're really concerned that like paying humans to go, try to convert self-serve usage is not a good use of money. And you got to be really careful because you don't want them cannibalizing uh, a, a motion that, um, that, that self-serve engine can run. You want that to be efficient. And we can talk more about how you think about that stuff. But like we learned very early on that like if you insert, especially a product like Airtable that does require some learning and a little bit of onboarding to understand how to adopt and, and use the tool, if you add a human-led motion to it, it really does uh, add a multiplier to a really strong PLG motion. And it's really efficient, right? Because we could get the team really focused on, we got the thing humming to a, a place where we could filter out the leads and, and the types of signups that we thought could survive on their own or go down more of an education, a self-serve education path, um, and then add the human layer to uh, a motion to really kind of be a force multiplier on the revenue. Um, as the business evolved over the four years, we started to move more and more up market, right? So we're talking about like, that is like a very much an inbound driven motion. Then how do you start thinking about layering on uh, a more like tops down approach, you know? Um, and so we have progressed over the years to a place where we've built out the sales organization and on top of like continuing to refine that inbound motion, uh, how do you start tackling uh, things up up market, right? Uh, inevitably, a vast majority of cases, you know, even in those days, we had like something like 7,000 inbound signups a day. A vast majority of those were coming from companies that were in like the sub 300 employee count space, right? Those are ultimately going to be smaller companies for the most part. You don't have like a like VPs at Fortune 500 companies typically like self-serving into your product. You could, and you know, it happens, but it's much more rare. And so like in order to tackle that space, you have to start generating more of a proactive motion there. And so then the question becomes, you know, Airtable was fortunate enough to be in a place where even in those larger businesses, we did have pockets of usage. So how do you leverage that usage? Typically uh, folks that are uh, more junior level, le level, we call them like builders or creators, like tinkerers within the product. How do you leverage that to get up into uh, higher value use cases? And so that's where the question has, like the, the questions have evolved to, how do we just convert these, these use cases down market to how do we leverage in product adoption into much larger conversations in the enterprise um, on top of the, the other things that come with the enterprise space, the securities and compliance, the less sexy things that you need to focus on from like a, a product and go to market perspective. So that's been the evolution, um, and it's been a uh, a wild ride. I have about four hundred questions that we can dive into from that opening. That I am going to take you extremely off track of the questions I prepped you with. Um, so okay, great. You, you talked about um, early days. There was this concept of an onboarding specialist, which I think in a lot of other companies is similar to a product specialist or sales assist, where maybe folks. It sounded like you weren't even giving them quotas maybe, and they weren't comped on um, really turning those self-serve deals into enterprise sales. Before we get into the persona that you hire for for now, where you have reps running up market, can you talk a little bit about what that onboarding specialist looked like? So yeah. say I'm at Airtable four years ago. It's a very interesting profile. Uh, you know, I, I think that like, I, I'll tell you one thing, which is like that profile doesn't exist much now in the company's maturity, you know, mm -hmm. like meaning like that role had doesn't really exist now. I think it becomes harder and harder to justify as the company matures, as you think about, um, 
you know, how much revenue are you tying to that profile, et cetera. But that's a whole separate thing. That profile in the beginning was a, like a very entrepreneurial, you know, like I, I was looking for folks. I mean, I think there are some people on this call <laughs> that I hired into that role. Uh, but the, I was looking for folks that um, had a uh, had like a like a like a, a, a desire to be a, in a sales motion. And so I knew this would evolve into a sales motion, right? So hmm. someone that had kind of that closing spirit, um, but were uh, uh, savvy enough to uh, be technical in nature in some sense. So I would take them through an interview process that actually had them really try to understand Airtable and teach it back to me. Um, and we had a relatively high bar uh, for that for that uh, for that role, even though it was like relatively junior in nature. I will say that the people that went through that program, that onboarding specialist program, ended up being some of the best reps at the company, without question. Like their product knowledge, their understanding of the customer journey, um, understanding how to add value beyond just ask for the check at the end of the day, uh, gave them. Uh, some tools that were far more reaching than uh, and allowed them to be really strong in kind of like this PLG world uh, gave them a real leg up uh, compared to some of their counterparts um, I think in the, in the sales world. So very unique profile for a very unique moment in time. Uh, it's like someone that really wants to like be a part of something that's very ambiguous and, uh, and kind of new age and uh, be along for the ride. It's a great point that it's not the traditional, maybe it is a traditional seller, but it doesn't have to be. It's more someone who's kind of hungry, entrepreneurial, ready to dive in, deal with ambiguity. I'd be curious, something you mentioned early on is that you needed to make sure that these onboarding specialists were engaging and helping users get more value out of Airtable rather than cannibalizing what would already be self-serve. I think every single PLG, PLS company struggles with this. And I'm not sure if anyone if there's kind of a, a rule or a golden piece of insight that can actually solve this problem. But I'd be curious, early days at Airtable, how did you make sure that those onboarding specialists weren't cannibalizing the self-service yeah, yeah. and weren't going after? Uh, it's a really, really hard one. And I think it's very, it's going to be very unique to every single business. I mean, I think that there's a couple of axes that we think about. One is like, we want the humans focused on uh, our talent humans. They're more than humans. They're are they're like the most valuable part of our business. We want them focused on like the long like long term revenue, right? And so, like even if there are companies or individuals that are seeing early signs of success, but like they are just very very small businesses, or like they're an intern at some at, at or like they're a college student or whatever. Like that is not where you want them focusing time. Even if that might be short term revenue, it's not long term revenue. And so, like trying to think about very basic things like what is the company size and what is the mm -hmm. vertical and what is the profile of the user, what is their potential sophistication is one of the things that we consider. Right? Is this someone that's in our kind of like our ideal set of customer ideal uh, like ICPs or customer profiles, or is it someone that's just so far out there? Even if like the signs are good like that, it's just like not going to lead to long-term success. And so really get them dialed on some form of repeatability. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing that I would just mention is like, this is a very iterative process, meaning like we were messy in the beginning and and, the, and we were doing a lot of like undue work that like a, a, a really sharp like education program could do to onboard someone. And over time, you try to take more and more and more and more work off of people's plate. Right. How do we automate? How do we automate? How do we automate more and more and more over time? And so, like, to me, it's less about like finding that perfect balance in the beginning and more like getting going, getting started and then taking stuff off as much as possible and getting and refining that that motion as much as possible over a period of time. This is exactly how we, we suggest it to our customers as well. It's there's no magical motion, right? You need to just start experimenting and you need to put something in place, learn from it quickly. And when things start working, automate it. When it doesn't work, scrap it. So um, it seems like that was very, very aligned at Airtable. Uh, I'd be curious before I open it up to questions for the community. So let's fast forward two or three years at Airtable, maybe onboarding specialists, those folks you hired have matured or graduated in trad traditional sales roles. Now you're hiring more enterprise sellers, but for a product-led product, what does that profile look like of hiring someone in product-led sales? Yeah. 
You know, I think that like independent of product led sales, I think the profile of the seller has changed a lot over the years, even in my short career. Um, I think that uh, really sales as a motion has become more sophisticated, it requires a higher business acumen. I think the uh, the um, the uh, information that is available to the buyer is very different than it was when I started my career, meaning like typically, you know, when I started, I remember like sitting and like making like 60 cold calls a day. And I'm not saying like that motion is dead because that part of that is still necessary. But like now it's like, what number do you even really call? You know, it's like the, you, there are the numbers are out there, but like the way in which people are working and responding to the market are very different. Um, what they can learn from their own research is very different. And so like, I think, uh, in, and in addition, like the types of products that we're selling are really technical and complex in nature. And so it requires like a high level of sophistication from like a selling standpoint. Um, so I'll say that uh, to say this, which is like, um, you know, athletic nerd is like this thing that I joke about. In fact, I coined this with a account of a very dear friend of mine, this guy, Will Paulus, who I think, you know, uh, he worked with me at Algolia and worked with me prior at Mixed Panel. We coined this at Mixed Panel because like we had this realization that some of our best reps were these reps that were like not only had the attributes of a good seller, meaning like competitive and hustle and uh, knew how to like do the do like run a, a sales playbook and all of those things, but had a sense of intellect, right? Like we're like genuinely curious and in the way that a business functions uh, um, uh, could understand if you ran through a complex business model could say like, okay, yeah, not only do I understand the way that this business generates revenue, but I can like see into the future about what their goals may be and then dial that down to uh, who I'm talking to and what might be important to this person. That level of business acumen is like, is high, you know? And then on top of that, Mixed Panel was like an extremely technical product. I mean, like we were talking directly and selling to engineers and the people that did um, the best in the field were the people that didn't just like pass the buck off to their sales engineer every single time someone asked a technical question. And so uh, we came up with this idea of like an athletic nerd. I think at the time it had a different name, but like athletic nerd is what I've like, is what it's evolved to, to me. Um, so it's this combination of like this superpower of like athletic, meaning like you've got that drive and the athleticism of a sales rep and like the hunger and all of those things. And then the nerd element, which is like technical aptitude, business acumen, curiosity, intellectual curiosity, willingness to be coached, et cetera. So uh, I think like those to me are universal. And, and there are other things like at Airtable, we use uh, uh, I, I, what we call IDEC, which is intellectual curiosity, drive, experience, and coachability. It could take many different forms. I, I, I think that like, it's a little bit of a trick question because, you know, it, it, anytime I would enter a business and build a profile for who I'm buying for, I look at the field first. I try to understand what the attributes are that make someone great and that put that back into the interview process. And so ultimately some of these things are going to be universal. Um, and um, uh, I see someone's asking for a repeat on the abbreviation. It's intellectual curiosity, drive, experience, and coachability, IDEC. Um, there is no perfect, that is just one of a million examples of how this stuff works. Um, but um, uh, again, I think it's like, I think it's a, it's a little bit unique because you want to tailor it to the business that you're in. And what are the attributes that make someone successful in that business? And I can talk about how you like bring that back into the interview process and, and test for it and all of those things. I'm happy to go there. Let's do it. I think that's a great, because you can have all of these kind of ways and frameworks of saying, you know, we need people with this quality. I think interview process, it's hard. Um, and well, we have our three AEs at focus on the call right now, who I would say are all athletic nerds. Um, but like, we really had to iterate on our interview process a lot over time to figure out like, how do you test for these qualities? So I'd be very curious, you being in this for lots and lots of time, how do you do that? Yeah. Uh, Let's see, how do you test? So, so I mean, I think like, first of all, like you want to create a system where you are very dialed on what you are actually testing for. You know, I think that like the biggest issue that companies run into when they're interviewing is like, they come up with general attributes and then they like kind of just like throw people out and say like interview for these things. But like, how are you actually grading them? How do you make it quantitative in addition to qualitative? Because a lot of these, how do you like actually make, convert these into numbers and compare people against one another? Uh, those are the questions that you should be asking yourself. So like, 
to me, it's like, if you take a think about the process from start to finish, it's establish your list of attributes, right? So it might be those four that I just described, plus a couple others that are important to you. And then put pen to paper on how you're actually going to test for those things. Um, assign them out into your interview panel. Um, and then I, oh, I'm a big believer in, in, in making them quantifiable, you know? So like one of the things that I like, I think a lot of companies run into is they like, okay, like rate them on a scale of one to four. In that scale, everyone is a three, right? Or like a high three or a low three because no one like wants to be a two and no one's a four, right? So it's just like, how are you really going to dial this in to be a, a dialed scale that gets someone to a final score and uh, and then gets you into a, a discussion post interview around how that how they fit into that um, that uh, that rubric. The other thing that you're going to run into is like when you get into the debrief, you're going to get a lot of things where people are like, "Oh yeah, like in terms of intellectual curiosity, I got like a really good vibe that they were like really curious." It's like, no, no. What is the actual specific example that you got in the interview that displayed the score that justified the score that you gave them? Like, what is the actual specific example? And if the person that did, uh, uh, the person that gave you that, like, can't get you a good, like, specific example, then you're not, you're not getting dialed on the interview process itself. And then perhaps the most important part of the process itself is, like, is, like, the postmortem. So, like, once you've made your hire and you've put those people into the sales process, how are they doing? And, like, are they, if you grade them again on the same attributes three months later, how did you do in the interview itself? Or do you even have the right attributes themselves? And so um, I think holding yourself accountable to be making this interview process iterative over time and being really di dialed from, like, a data perspective is very important to me. That was that was awesome. Thank you, Sam. And one more question on the topic of kind of hiring and enabling your athletic nerds. Uh, or whatever acronym you want to use before we go over to some other questions. Sandy asks, kind of, how do you actually continue to train and enable AEs um, on these concepts that you were interviewing them for? What did that tactically look like at Airtable or other companies that you've been at? Great question. Yeah. So I think uh, I, I, I am a big believer in, uh, I'm very data-driven and operationally driven. And I just think that like, coaching through that is very important. Uh, there's two things, uh, two elements of coaching. There's like uh, coaching to metrics and then coaching to the qualitative elements. Like how do you run a good discovery call or whatever, right? And so one thing is, is like you always want to have the data at the rep level, in my opinion. Um, and so that is going to come in some form of a funnel, right? It's going to be some form of leading indicators, call volume or conversion metrics through lead to meeting to opportunity to win? How are you doing through that funnel at the individual contributor level? And then what part of that funnel are you strongest and weakest in, right? So if your conversion is really strong at the top of the funnel, but it's weaker at the bottom of the funnel, then you as a coach need to double click into, you know, okay, let, let me give that make it to make this more tangible. Your conversion rate is really good from meeting to opportunity, but it's actually really poor from opportunity to win, let's just say. Uh, so, okay, that, cool. That's my focus is in that part of the funnel. That we got to double click into the specific elements of that data piece, right? So if it's post opportunity creation, what is the conversion rate through the opportunity itself? Is it at the at the start of the opportunity, meaning from like discovery to initiation of a pilot or whatever that might be, uh, or is it in kind of the closing mechanisms of the deal? And they get really dialed and specific around where the rep is there. Uh, and then the most important thing is as you're coaching to it, to following up on the data and looking back at a week over week and month over month. Um, there's also the qualitative element, which is like, uh, how does this manifest itself on like you actually doing stuff in the field as opposed to just the la the worst thing you can do as a sales leader is just like kind of coach the numbers and yell at the scoreboard and just be like, you need to increase your conversion rates. You know, that's no good. So it's like, what are you actually doing to coach them around it? We have this thing called, uh, forget what, what I, what I called it, like a, a rep scorecard. Uh, a lot of the reps are on, some of my reps are on this call. They, they, they know it better than I do at this point, but basically like ultimately a rep's job is to build pipeline or build pipeline, move pipeline and close pipeline. Right. Ultimately that's really it. There's other cultural elements and other things that are very, very important to making a, a, an organization successful. But within those three elements, I think that there are uh, things that make you great. In the building pipeline, there's uh, 
there's a building account plans, building PG plans and moving pipeline. There's execution through an evaluation, closing pipeline, negotiation and procurement, right? And so I created this scorecard, which has all of those different elements in the scorecard in a rating on one to five that is very transparent where the reps are rating themselves and the managers are rating them. And then they're having open dialogue every single week around where they stand on those things. And then at a director level or a 2LL level, I'm holding my managers accountable on a monthly basis to... What are you focused on with your rep and how are you moving their score up, their total score? Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, it's about like having a chain of command that's operationally focused on enablement. And without that, you get into a situation that I call coaching to deals instead of coaching to trends, right? Coaching to deals is what most managers do, which is like, oh, every single week, I'm going to just coach you on what deals are active right now. That doesn't improve the rep in the greater scheme of things. It doesn't coach to the trends of what they're good and bad at, right? It's just coaching to like whatever's in front of you that week or that day. And so creating some kind of operationalized system like this allows you to coach to trends over deals. The deal coaching is important. You got to do it. But like in, we're talking about like career progression here and like making people step up better. Um, that stuff happens with coaching to trends. So uh, uh, that I think is a, a really important point. Thank you. The trends over deals. That is incredible insight. I appreciate that. Let's go to some of the folks asking questions. Daniel Smith, do you want to unmute and ask yours? Sure. Yeah. For a PLG motion, you have so many different customers you can choose to speak to and choose to like invest in onboard. I'm curious what you found was a better indicator of growth down the road, whether it's how much and how well they're using your product today, or if it's more their profile, like their industry or size, um, like what metrics you prefer to look at? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I look, I, I think that this is, again, it's a really, really tough one. I'm not going to have a great answer for you because I think it's very specific to the business and the product, et cetera. But essentially, it's some kind of profile of both. Right. Ultimately, I can tell you right now that long term revenue is going to come is going to be more sustainable. Generally, the larger the company is uh, where the revenue is, meaning amount of funding. So like we created profiles based on company size, based on funding and based on vertical. Right. That fed into uh, persona information. So things like what is the type of like what is like the, the vertical or the use case? So product and marketing we found to be extremely compelling. And within those people with certain titles and seniority were very compelling. Um, and we built all of that into what we called a, a product qualified lead. So I worked with my data team to create like this algorithm based off of all of these different factors and different scores. And it would spit out information and surface up to the rep. Hey, this is someone that you should focus on based on a long laundry list of information and a buildup of a score. So that required tinkering and like, uh, oh, in addition to the profile, it was product usage, obviously, right? So and, and so like once they got to a certain sophistication score, meaning they were using certain elements of the product, um, they were doing certain things, they were logging in a certain number of times, uh, all of that compiled into a, a metric, a unified metric that we actually saw would convert at higher rates than uh, people who didn't meet those standards. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um, Gorov, I know you've had a couple of questions. Do you want to unmute and ask? It looks like your last one might be the most relevant. Gorov. Hey, can you folks hear me? Yep. I'm sorry, there's some background noise, but the question I had, Sam, was especially in the early stage of product development, sales plays a very influential role in figuring out differentiation. So it seems like you were there uh, and Airtable's growth and differentiation phase. So I'm curious about how you nail that and more generally what tactics you would recommend to get to that phase earlier, at least ideas of what differentiation would look like, particularly from the PM sales uh, collaboration. I know that's a long question, but I'm just curious what you have to say. Yeah, get a little Thank bit you. more specific for me. Like what, what exactly, uh, what's the route here that uh, you want me to focus on? So it's more where the idea of you know who the target customer is that yeah. you know will give you the highest conversion rate 
yeah. and particularly what the pain point you're solving for them that is different from the competition. I think those two answers from a signal, how do you get to as quickly as possible? That's a great question. You know, at Airtable, I mean, I think that we had, uh, there's two different types of, it depends on what where you are at as a business. Airtable was fortunate enough to have a massive, a tremendous amount of inbound, right? And that's like what made our PLG motion so strong. And with that inbound came a tremendous amount of data. And so even in the self-serve motion, we could, without even touching the human experience, um, we could dissect pretty quickly that like you... Um, uh, our conversion rates and our revenue, right, was coming from this particular set. Uh, there was like an organic fit with a particular set of personas, verticals, use cases, et cetera. And so like we leveraged that data in our actual outbound go to market. And so like we converted it onto the human side and then went and executed around it. Um, there's another piece of this, right? I guess like the flip side of that would be like, well, what if you don't have that type of inbound and you're trying to like figure that stuff out to begin with? Um and I think that like, A, I, I you know, I, I think it, it's hard. There's two things here. One is like, I think you have to have an opinion to be, you shouldn't be afraid to have like an opinion in your go-to-market strategy and be wrong about it. You know, uh, I think the most important thing is having focus. If you're all over the place, I mean, Airtable is an extremely horizontal product. And so we could sell, one of the issues that we run into today is like you have reps that are one day talking to a head of a real estate company and then the next day talking to a head of finance, some SaaS business, right? Those are very disparate use cases, very difficult to find repeatability there. And so finding some element of repeatability as quickly as possible is like the most important thing. So hence focus, right? And so like iterating through elements of focus, meaning like I have a hypothesis around based on where we've seen and where the product is going to fit from a market perspective on where that's going to be. I would encourage the team to focus on a couple of things first and see how that goes and iterate on that over time. Uh, hopefully that kind of gets at your question, Gaurav. I'm curious how you find that repeatability. Because you, I know that you have really strong use cases in marketing or in sales or in product management. Do you separate your AEs by specific use cases or by industries? And what was that journey to figure out where you're where you're routing your athletic nerds? I mean, we didn't, yeah, routing the athletic nerds. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it is it's shocking even at this stage for Airtable how focused we still are. Okay, so like even at our stage, we're talking about like hundreds of million dollars in revenue and like a very like a very serious go to market motion with a large sales force. We are still really focused on a couple of very specific ideal profiles. Okay, Um, it's like you you need to uh, there's a lot of companies out there that are so verticalized, they build an entire billion dollar business off of a specific vertical and persona. Right. And so like. There is plenty to go after in the market with that level of focus. And I think I would be lying if I told you that we have like cracked the code on like perfect repeatability on those verticals. There's so much to learn and so much to go after uh, when it comes to that. So um, I, uh, our teams are uh, right now we're in a place where it's focused. It's not so dialed where it's like you have a, a team that is perfectly, we're not like completely verticalized yet. Like you take a company like Salesforce, they have teams that are just focused on healthcare and they're completely verticalized, et cetera. We're nowhere there, near there yet. And so Airtable has always kind of left it up to the reps and where they are from their book of business, uh, their account planning, what they're doing to set up their quarters to work with their managers and be like, okay, I am going to be focused on uh, the product team at this company. I'm going to be focused on the marketing team at this company um, and uh, and be relatively dialed at that at, at, from that standpoint. One of the things that I do to try to drive focus is that at the beginning of every single week, I have my reps set up a game plan for what their PG strategy is. So every single week, everyone submits on Friday when they're prepping their week for the next week, they need to announce to the team and then come in on Monday And they go around the horn in their team meetings on Monday and be like, hey, my focus areas this week are going to be this company. I've got this set of ideal profiles. And then uh, I am going to uh, focus on on, on this use case. I've done my research. Here's my account plan. This is my hypothesis around how Airtable can help. This is where I'm going to draft some of my outbound strategy. And I'm going to go. And that's going to be my focus this week. 
right? So like even now, it's less about like being so dialed that every single rep is focused on one vertical, et cetera. But it's more about like uh, giving them the ability to be creative within their book of business, but then come in every single week with a sense of tremendous focus. It's a, it's a really good point that you've made a couple times of around experimentation of, you know, it's not going to be perfect what your PQL is or kind of what your PG effort is going to be, but it's more around having focus and staying focused there and running after it to make sure you're learning as fast as possible and iterating yep. from there. Um, and, I, and I love the concept of, you know, Airtable can really successfully benefit various use cases. And so it's just, what are we going to focus on? this week, what industry, what use case, what persona, and then running after it and crushing that before moving to the next. Yep. Um, yep. Oh, go ahead. No, I'm good. I, I want to head on to Vana's question. I know we don't have that much time, um, but what have you seen as the biggest challenge of your of Airtable moving up market and maybe having reps that were more skilled for a sales assist motion and moving to an enterprise acquisition motion? Where to begin with this one? You know, where to begin? I, 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 every single company I've ever worked at eventually works their way up market. I mean, there are some companies that start tops down. Uh, typically, in this PLG world, you're 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 moving up market in some sense. I would really compartmentalize this problem into kind of like the operational side of the house, the product side of the house, and the culture side of the house. Right? Uh, culturally. You're talking about, you know, a world when I was at Airtable in the beginning, we could be, hit all of our targets and see tremendous growth purely off of the inbound motion, right? All of a sudden, as you grow and you scale and you scale, you move up market, you start trying to create an outbound culture, a PG culture, a highly sophisticated like account planning culture. That's a completely different muscle and a completely different culture. And that transition culturally is difficult. And like, there is a, uh, there's a lot that uh, I can tell you about that experience. Um, and the people that I think do well transitioning through that change and the people that I think struggle a little bit more. So that's kind of like the cultural element. There's the operational side, right? So like the focus operationally becomes uh, so much less about tinkering at scale, using massive amounts of data to understand what specific profiles are going to get you X outcome, and more about like getting the reps focused on the right accounts and the right profile and the right territory, et cetera. Up market, uh, what, are the, what are the indicators? You know, like in the enterprise business, the PLG motion is going to be a lot more like taking a pocket of usage, understanding what that use case is and trying to move up the chain with it, getting to a VP or someone quote unquote above the line, director level and above. So like, what are the data points that you're surfacing to the reps that don't become overwhelming from that those pockets of usage, right? So that they can still do their outbound motion while also leveraging some of this PLG stuff. That's very different than purely trying to convert the inbound motion bottoms up. And then, uh, so that's like the operational side. Uh, and then there's like go-to-market readiness, you know, product readiness, like uh, uh, compliance, security, uh, getting the reps thinking about how does the conversation go and how is it tactfully different talking to a, a million dollar deal that is wall to wall at like a VP level versus trying to convert someone uh, in a much more transactional sale. Uh, that is like that, that go to market readiness from a marketing perspective uh, and, a, and a product perspective uh, carries a lot of challenges as well. So it's like a really, it's a big uh, evolution across all fronts as you move up market. I think one of the things that I am passionate about is never losing who you are uh, from a PLG motion perspective, right? So uh, you just uh, want to continue to be more and more and more and more efficient down market and move those resources up. And I think that the companies that try to just flip the switch and just be like, hey, guys, guess what? We're going to be enterprise now. Let's go ahead. Let's go hire some enterprise reps and like go go uh, go outbound on the enterprise. They're gonna they're gonna get slapped in the face really really quickly because like you have to transition this uh, and be ready for that motion. It's not something that you just like turn on, you know. Uh, so uh, that is a very much a an ongoing uh, process that takes uh, time and effort and people and uh, cultural changes. Hmm. And is there, I really appreciate that kind of explanation of there's folks that are going to be onboarding specialists that are going to be different than the folks that can be 
really good at running the PLG sales model of let's find a bunch of pockets of usage and roll that up who are going to be different than selling in a million dollar deal. Do you find that sales reps can kind of transition seamlessly through each role? And if yes, kind of what did those sales reps do to make sure that they're able to be successful at each stage of the- I mean, I did, it's, it's, I, the, the answer is yes, they can transition. Is it seamless? The answer is no, right? <laughs> so like, um, I just like, A, you, you know, like you hire reps for different phases of the business and um, the, um, you know, uh, uh, one of like the sad truths that all of us have been through is like some people who were like tremendous- contributors at one phase of the business just like may not be a fit at a different stage of the business. You know, that's like just a reality for, for them and for the business. Um, there are other people who transition beautifully, right? And like based on, I believe some of these elements around uh, these attributes that make an athletic nerd allow them to like ride that wave, allow them to be emotionally invested in the business long-term. So it is a, uh, it is a process. Um, and um, um it will, uh, and it's tough. It's tough. Yeah. I, I know we're at time. This was awesome, Sam. I really appreciate more detail into the athletic nerd, both in hiring and enabling in kind of figuring out how to structure your team to make reps as successful as possible. This was really, really awesome and just super impressive background at Airtable and being able to give us all the incredible insights. So thank, thank you. Thank so you for having me. Here. Appreciate it. I'm always available if anyone wants to uh, to reach out and hang out and talk more about this stuff. I'm uh, If you can't tell, I'm passionate about it. Thank you, Sam. So should they find you on LinkedIn? Find me on LinkedIn. I'm on there. Perfect. Like, uh, I think I'm on there. <laughs> so find Sam on LinkedIn. If you want to do more of these community AMAs, you can join our focus community. Um, thank you, Sam. Thank you to everyone in the community. So excited to see you next time. Bye, everyone.